Welcome to the Enniscope Society's second public lecture this year, Christian Sexual Ethics, Philosophical and Theological Foundations. I'm Ben Coons, the co-president of Enniscope. Uh, the Society is a student organization founded in 2005 for the purpose of promoting sexual integrity, marriage, and the family on Princeton's campus. Since then, nearly two dozen similar groups have spawned at other universities across the country. Anscombe holds weekly discussions, hosts dinner seminars with professors, and hosts public debates and lectures similar to this one. I'd like to thank all the Christian fellowships that co-sponsored tonight's event with us. Thank you to Father Dave Swantek and the Aquinas Institute, Princeton Catholic Chaplaincy, Pastor Martin Earhart from the Lutheran Campus Ministry, Princeton Faith in Action, our friends Razio Christi, located at Rutgers University, and Christian Union. The Anscombe Society is not itself a Christian organization, although its positions on sexual issues are not in conflict with Christian sexual teaching. Indeed, they often resemble each other. The same natural law tradition developed in classical and Hellenistic period, was, which was so influential in the early Christian tradition, is the same font for our own thought. Society does not endorse Christianity over other religions, but sexual ethic is one especially suited for human flourishing, and so we wish to explore it this afternoon. We'd also like to thank the Love and Fidelity Network, our committed supporters. The network aids many uh, Anscombe Societies across the country. For anyone interested in supporting the Anscombe Society this program financially, please ask our treasurer, uh, Joe Perez, uh, handing out the surveys right now, uh, at the table in the back after the presentation. I'd like to also ask everyone to fill out the surveys that are either on your chair or being handed out right now. Uh, we'll be collecting them at the table in the back in that nice blue box. Finally, and most importantly, I'd like to thank our guest speaker tonight, Professor Alexander Proust. Professor Proust is a professor at the Department of Philosophy at Baylor University. He is a prolific philosopher, having written four books in the past decade, including The Existence of God, The Principle of Sufficient Reason, Actuality, Possibility, and Worlds, and most recently his book, One Body, which is the subject of tonight's talk. Professor Robert George said of it, this is a terrific, really quite extraordinary work of scholarship. It's quite simply the best work on Christian sexual ethics that I have seen. Oxford professor and natural law theorist John Finnis wrote, his argumentation is at every point attractively direct, careful, energetic, and framing and responding to objections, and admirably attentive to realities and the human goods at stake. He has a PhD in math, as well as a PhD in philosophy from the University of Pittsburgh, and he's even published in several math journals. He currently lives in Waco, Texas, with his wife and three children. Please welcome Professor Cruz. Well, it's a great pleasure to be in the warm north here. It's, it's actually warm not just by the great welcome I've received, but it's also actually slightly warmer than the way of Texas today. OK, so I'm going to, in this talk, this is a kind of framework talk. I'm not going to here defend, in the main talk, particular rules of sexual ethics particular prohibitions, requirements, recommendations. But some of the, th but the things I will say have implications for these. And I'll be happy to discuss those implications in the Q&A afterwards. So I'm going to do the things I'll talk about. Uh, the talk is from a Christian standpoint. But I'm not going to be relying on sort of controverted bits of scripture, particular prohibitions or requirements from scripture. I'm going to be relying on sort of general, very general principles from the New and Old Testament about sexuality, principles that I think are actually fairly plausible independently of scripture. So they will be particularly thought by the Christians, but I think there's a kind of way in which the human heart finds some of these principles about the importance and centrality of love, the nature of romantic love, the union of, as one body and commitment as very natural to us. So 
One hears Christianity called a religion of love. Um, one often hears this from critics in that kind of, of way. If you're in the form of conditionals, if you are a religion of love, why do you do such and such? But there is something to the thought of Christianity as a religion of love. And this is, I think, particularly the case for Christian ethics. Right? So Jesus says that his commandment is that we love one another as Jesus loved us and that we be willing to love to the point of laying down our life for our friends, ideally. Um, Paul thinks that ethics, Christian ethics, is all somehow grounded in love. That if you act lovingly, then you will fulfill all of the moral law. Now this is puzzling. I mean, the moral law, the ethics, concerns all sorts of behaviors, and it isn't clear how it is that just being loving makes you make, say, the right decisions in difficult medical ethics questions or in questions of social policy and the distribution of the taxation burdens and things like that. But it seems to be that that was Paul's conviction, that somehow love grounds all, of, all ethical questions or answers to all ethical questions. But nonetheless, we may often not be able to see how it grounds it. Paul was well aware that the human mind is darkened by sin, ignorance, social pressures, and so on, which can make it difficult to see sometimes how all sorts of moral rules follow from commandments to love. Now, here's a consequence from this sort of um, founding Christian principle that morality is all somehow a derivative from love. Love cannot just be a feeling. Why? Well, because love is commanded to Christians. You can't command feelings. Feelings are not in, your, in our direct control. Um, moreover, uh, you know, feel, feelings aren't something that endures all the time. If you get, if you do what love requires with respect to a young child, you may well stay up 24 hours. And after staying up for 23 of those 24 hours, you will not have loving feelings quite possibly. <laughs> you will have feelings of wanting to sleep. But nonetheless, you can still be loving. So love isn't just a feeling, though it no doubt has an emotional component. Moreover, no feeling would be enough for doing the right thing. I mean, if, if love was just a feeling, then you could just figure out what is the most convenient thing to do, and then just maybe take the right drugs to induce the feeling while doing those things. And you could do whatever you like as long as you had the right feeling. That can't be what an ethics of love is like. And the New Testament focuses love on actions. When Jesus talks about love, he almost always connects it to particular actions. Even the tenses that he used that are used in the Greek of the New Testament indicate because they're not the tenses used for enduring states that endure over time. They are tenses that are used for particular point actions at particular points. So the love of the New Testament comes to focus in actions. So, so one problem for an ethics of love is that is this conviction that I think popular culture has that love is a feeling, which would make an ethics of love untenable. Another serious problem is that we have all seen serious examples of love going wrong. Right? 
people loving one another, but nonetheless, you have possessive and jealous romantic partners, you have friends who don't give their friends enough time alone, you have parents who treat their adult children like they are mere children, you have fans who creepily worship celebrities. <laughs> All of these are in some way kinds of love, it seems. But there's something ethically deficient in all of these kinds of cases. I guess I've kind of given a moral rule, I've given away one of my moral rules, don't do these things. But that's not particularly controversial. So I think one of the consequences is that on an ethics of love, you, we not only have to love, but we have to love in the right way. There is a right way and sometimes the wrong way. A romantic partner needs to be loved as an equal. When we love our friends, we have to give them space, freedom, and autonomy. Adults need to be treated like adults. And human beings, mere human beings, must be treated as mere human beings rather than as gods. And that means that love requires some preconditions. It requires knowledge or at least some kind of awareness of oneself, of the other person, of the nature of love, and perhaps even of God. Because if we are not aware of others as creatures of God, there's a danger of missing out on something, of idolizing others as if they were gods. Okay, so I want to first give sort of on one slide just about all of, uh, the bits of, of scripture that I'm going to rely on are the central themes that I'm going to rely on. And there isn't going to be much. Uh, first, I want to make this little remark, which I think is interesting with regard to sexual ethics and else. If Christianity is a religion of love, and it gets wrong, central claims about love. It gets, it's really badly. It's really a bad mistake. Right? It's not just, it's a small mistake. If it gets central things about love wrong, it's really, well, rotten. So this is really important that we can get this right. So here are some central things. The first one I already talked about, love is at the heart of all morality. Here's another one. All the forms of love are really forms of the very same thing. The Greek terms agape. So we know that there are such things as romantic love, the, the, the love between spouses, the love between parents and children, the love between friends, neighbors, the love between us and God, and God and us. And uh, the, both the, uh, the New Testament and the Greek translations of the Old Testament refer to all of these as agape. They seem to be all treated as if, in some sense, they were the same. I'm going to show back to this. Uh, which is interesting, because sometimes one hears in sermons and elsewhere that the New Test that in the Greek there are several different concepts of love. There's agape, there's storge, there's philia, and these are all importantly distinct. But I actually think that that's not borne out in at least biblical Greek. It may be so in classical Greek, but in biblical Greek, as far as I can tell, agape and philia are actually used more or less interchangeably, and agape gets used just about everywhere. Uh, where the English love would be used. It has the same full range of meanings that the English word love does. Just like sometimes the English word love actually really seems to mean something closer to a selfish lust, there are times in the, in the Greek translations of the Old Testament where the, the verb agapao is used for something like a selfish lust. So it's not the same range of meaning that we've got in English. So somehow, the, the text presents to us all of these forms of love as forms of the same thing. 
Now they're obviously distinct, but there's obviously all, but the text suggests there's something they've all got in common. So the first of my tasks is going to be try to figure out, say a little bit of what I think all the forms of love have in common. And then the second part of my task is I will talk about romantic love and how it's different from other forms of love. And I'm going to suggest this is one of the other Christian <coughs> central scriptural claims that romantic love is consummated in a union that is described as a union as one body, sometimes as one flesh. We get this right at the beginning of Genesis, um, but we also get this in St. Paul. This union seems to have some kind of a deep biological nature. It's not just a matter of feelings. Uh, Paul it says that it talks of this union as one body as occurring between even the case of a man and a prostitute. In fact, that's his reason for not frequenting prostitutes, the one becomes one body with them. Which suggests that becoming one body is something physical. It's not a matter of psychological sense. Because of course, somebody could visit a prostitute and not have any kind of emotional connection. Yeah. So is there something, there's something physical going on, right? And and Jesus seems to take this become this joining as one flesh as sort of central to this to what marriage is and what romantic love is. Okay. So now I want to say a little bit about what I think love in general is like. <coughs> Philosophers over the ages, since Socrates, have tried to give definitions of things. Um, those of you who are philosophy students know that that has almost always, perhaps always, ended in failure. Right? You can try to give a definition of something. Maybe knowledge is justified true beauty. But somebody will come around and find counterexamples. I don't know any philosophical definition that is good. Um, but that doesn't mean that that's what philosophy is impossible. Even if we can't give definitions, we can still identify important features, important parts of the concept. And so although I can't define love, I think one of the undeniable features of it is that it's an appreciation. If you love somebody, you think there's something good about them. There's something lovable about them. There's something in them to appreciate. If only their potential to be better than they are. That might be all there is in some case. Secondly, there's goodwill. Namely, if you love somebody, you have a good will towards them. You want good things to happen to them. You want, you're trying to pursue what is good for them. This is presumably a large part of why it is that Paul and Jesus think that love is the center of morality. The center of morality is in some sense pursue, pursuing the good of other people. And so love's aspect of goodwill is central to that. But that's not all there is in love. It's not just a matter of appreciating and willing good things, at least not when it's interpersonal love. There's one more feature of love. If we love somebody, if we really love somebody, we want to be with them. We want to somehow join with them, spend time with them if possible. We, there's a striving for union. And I will talk more about that, quite a bit more. Now, some people think that you really, that all love is, is just one of these. Um, perhaps the most common is the claim that you get in some theologians, uh, like Anders Nygren, that love, or at least agape, is just something like goodwill. This is, I think, at least theologically, it's quite untenable. Love isn't just goodwill. God's love for us 
is an invitation to unite with God, to be one with God. So God's love for us has a striving for union. I don't know what God sees in us that would make him want to be united with, with me, or what he sees in me at least that would make him want to be united with me, but he does. That's quite amazing. So I think love needs all three aspects, and I'm going to spend some time arguing for this. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say a little bit about what love would be like. How would it be distorted if we left out one of the three aspects? So I'll go through each of them and talk about what it would be like if we left that out. So here's one combination. And you can sort of calculate various combinations, how many there are. If I don't appreciate somebody, but I have good will for them. I, you know, I think that there's nothing impre in impressive about them. I don't think uh, I enjoy spending time with them. I, but nonetheless, for some reason, I want good things to happen. I don't know why I want the good things to happen. Maybe it's out of a sense of duty to my neighbor or something like that. Well, first thing I'm doing, if I don't appreciate somebody, in this way, but I'm trying to do good things for them. I'm setting myself up as superior to them. I'm setting myself up as their benefactor. If somebody who can do good stuff for them, though they don't deserve it. And that can humiliate the recipient of my so-called charity. What if I do want, what if I don't appreciate another, but I somehow, for some strange and mysterious reason, still want to be united? It's a kind of mysterious. Why would I? I mean, there's nothing interest, nothing to appreciate about them. Why would I want to spend time with them? Why would I want to be united with them? Well, maybe I would. But it's kind of degrading. It's degrading for me to want to be united with something or someone I don't appreciate. But it's also obviously degrading for the other person to treat them in this way. So appreciation needs to be there. What if I don't want good things to happen to the other person? You know, maybe I just, uh, I, I really sort of admire them, I have appreciation for them, I think they look really good, maybe they're really sexy, or they're really smart, or they're really, uh, you know, helpful, but I, I don't want good things to happen to them. That's weird. Then I'm a fan and not a lover. What if I don't want good things to happen to somebody, but nonetheless I want to be united with them? That too would be weird. Um, then I'll be a creep. <laughs> this is the... It's like I don't care, but I don't care about whether you're going to like me, whether it's going to be good for you to be with me, but you must be with me. And that is selfish. I think if you really want to be united with the other person in the right way, then you need to pursue the other person's goals. And somehow you need to actually see that when you pursue another person, when you try to unite with another person, then we are actually good for the other person. So there's a way in which if we really love somebody, we have to also love ourselves. At least we have to appreciate ourselves. Because if we don't appreciate ourselves, then by trying to unite with them, we're uniting them to something that we think is worthless. And that's not good for them. So actually, love requires self-love of some sort. What if I don't want union? Um, maybe it's that I have some kind of abstract love. Like, you know, uh, I love the Mona Lisa. <coughs> You know, I, but I have no great desire to have the Mona Lisa hanging in my living room. Uh, it just wouldn't fit with the uh, with the color of the walls and the decor. Um, I'd have to install an alarm system. I don't want to be around the Mona Lisa all the time, but I appreciate it. Yeah. Okay, that's a fine attitude to, towards the Mona Lisa, but it's not a fine attitude towards another person. If it's another person, I can ask, do I really appreciate them? I mean, if I don't actually want to spend time with them, how am I really appreciating them? Do I really love myself then? I mean, if I think, 
if I appreciate them, I think there's something really wonderful about them, and I don't want to be with them. I don't like what, what so I don't like myself, and I don't want to have myself to have this good, uh, good thing that I spend time with this good person. That would be, that would be actually a kind of lack of love of myself. What if I don't want union, but I seek the other person's good? I think that's actually quite possible. I think one place it occurs is in something like philanthropy. Uh, somewhere, one of the characters in the Brothers Karamazov says uh, that it's a lot easier to love humankind than to love human beings. And I think that part of that is that when we love humankind, we're not trying to be united with humankind. Well, you are a human being. There's no such thing as being united with humankind, perhaps. You're just trying to have good things happen to other people. And it's easier, because you're not vulnerable. If I want to be united with somebody, I would become vulnerable, because they might reject me. They might not want to be united with me. They might not want to spend time with me. So there's a risk. So it's easier to love humankind. It's easier to help anonymous people. It's easier to write checks to charities than to want to spend time with smelly homeless people, say. But true love falses. If I seek the other's good, but I don't want to be with them, I'm demeaning them. I'm treating them with a cold charity. C.S. Lewis has this lovely line, in a scary line, he says, spiteful people will pretend to be loving us with charity precisely because no, they know it will wound us. You can sort of feel like the superior person is bestowing benefits on you, doing good things for you, but they don't really want to spend any time with you. And that's the meaning to feel that way. So I think all the forms of love have to have appreciation, Goodwill and pursuit of union. And there may well be other things. Like I said, I don't have a definition of love. And these things are going to be in all sorts of ways intertwined with each other. It's going to be in real, real relationships are messy. It's hard to separate these three things. Um, in some relationships, one of these will be bigger than others. Um, some people, in some relationships, the appreciation will be the most important. But in all healthy forms of love, you're going to have to. And different forms of love happen differently. But I actually think the main difference between different kinds of love is not in the appreciation or the goodwill, but in the union. So now that I want to talk a little bit about, I've talked a little bit about what all love has in common. Now I want to talk about what the different forms of love, say love of neighbor versus love of a sister versus love of a parent, what all of these how they differ. I think the main difference is in how one is united with them. Now, in every love, one actually does need to try to join with the other person in mind and emotion and will. You want, you want to see things from the other person's point of view, at least to some degree. You want to pursue the things that they want. Um, you want to feel with uh, what they feel to some degree. That much is actually going to be, to some degree, in common between all the kinds of love. But besides this uh, joining mind, will, and emotion, particular relationships of love have other ways of joining with another person. Conversation, I mean, writing something or something, um, caring for somebody physically, Changing a parent's diapers, changing a child's diapers, uh, sex. There are different ways that one gets close to other people in love and in the different kinds of love. You can have love without any of these added on things, but it's not going to be a fulfilled love. Like if you know, if it's the person you love above uh, everybody else ends up somehow imprisoned on the other end of the world and you have no way of getting to them, you can still love them, even though you can't do any of these things with them. But your love is unfulfilled. It's a kind of tragic love. 
And the way you have this further kind of union with the other person needs to fit the form of love. All right, as you, you see my little list, it's pretty clear that some of these are appropriate in some context, in some love relationships, and others are appropriate in other love relationships. Love must have the right form. And I know it's just not like even the right subform. Um, the way you love a person in a long-term relationship changes with time. Right? One of the distortions I gave earlier was parents who love their adult children as if they were small children. Well, that was a perfectly appropriate for some form of parental love when we were children. It was perfectly appropriate for our parents to love us as small children when we were small children. But when we are no longer small children, parents still love us with parent-child love, for they should, but it's a different subform. It's a different version of it. Love needs to evolve. Uh, if we are going to actually have an unchanging commitment to another human being, when human beings are changing things, the only way we can do that is if we are committed to allowing our love to change. And evolve as the other person changes, as their needs change. And perhaps those changes can be quite rapid. Sometimes they'll be small, sometimes they'll be big. So getting the form of love right is really crucial. So now I want to talk about specifically romantic love and how it's different. And let me start with a little made up story, or at least the names are made up, but the story occurs over and over in the world. So you have two women, Kyle and Megan. They share their deepest thoughts. Each will stand by the other through thick and thin. Neither can imagine living without the other. Each thinks of herself as somebody who is in this love relationship with the other. They identify themselves as somebody in this relationship with the other. The other's death, or, or worse, the other's betrayal, would be the end of the world for each of them. Sometimes Kyle and Megan argue, but then they find that not being together is intolerable, and so they make up. Sometimes their friends joke that they should be married. In most places in the world, a marriage between Kyle and Megan would not be recognized. But they don't mind. They don't mind because their love doesn't need the institution of marriage. They really will be there to each other, for each other, no matter what happens to them. Their relationship is deeper than that of most heterosexual couples. After all, they are identical twins. So you can have a deep love that has deep emotional sharing, care for one another, that has no romantic component whatsoever. So this story, this is sort of, you know, when I talk to identical twins, I hear, maybe I sort of went a little overboard, but I hear things that sound very much like this. You know, I actually hear sometimes identical twins saying things like, I could never be close to a spouse, as close to a spouse as I am to my sister. Not every identical origins like that, but some are like that. And this story, I think, shows that here's one way not to distinguish romantic love from other loves. We shouldn't distinguish it by saying it's deeper, that romantic love is somehow deeper, more important, better. What Kyle and Megan have is every bit as good as romantic love, perhaps 
better than in most cases some romantic love. So if it's not better, well, and go back to the Christian revelation, notice how Jesus characterizes the best kind of love. He doesn't characterize it in terms of romance and things like that. He characterizes the best kind of love in terms of sacrifice. He says, greater love than this has nobody to lay down their life for their friend. So it's in terms of what one is willing to do. Kyle and Megan, in my story, are willing to give up their life for each other because life without the other is unimaginable to them. So if it's not the degree of love that makes a difference, how is erotic or romantic love different? Actually, we're going to not distinguish between erotic or romantic. I think they're different stages of the same uh, phenomenon or different degrees of the same phenomenon. Well, in erotic or romantic love, the goodwill that you have for the other person may be the same as in other kinds of love. Right? The kind of goodwill that Kyle and Megan have for each other is very similar to that that the best uh, romantic couples have. Maybe you might say, well, here's a difference. Here's a difference. In romantic love, you appreciate the other physically. You appreciate the other physical, other's physicality. I'm not certainly true, and we do. But is that the difference? For instance, even in something that's very superficial as a kind of love, you can have appreciation of physicality, right? If you appreciate an athlete, um, you appreciate typically some part of their physicality, how strong they are, how fast they are, how agile they are. And that's not romantic. I mean, it could become romantic, or it could become a distortion of romantic, but it doesn't have to be. Okay, well, all right, but you know, when you appreciate an athlete, you don't appreciate their sexual physicality. Right? If you appreciate how fast they can run, you don't appreciate them as sexual beings. But I actually think that sexual, that appreciating another sexual physicality isn't enough for romantic love either. I imagine a scientist who studies nudie brands, hermaphroditic mollusks, they're just gorgeous creatures. And they're hermaphrodites, so they can make to themselves. And you can have great appreciation of the evolutionary advantages of their way of life. You know, you don't have to see how they mate. It's, it's just great. You think you want, you, they're just so, so gorgeous creatures. So you appreciate their physical beauty. You appreciate their sexuality. And there's nothing perverse about that. There's nothing romantic about that either. Right? So just appreciating somebody's physical, sexual physicality doesn't, well, this is not a, someone, but you, do, but you can imagine a scientist who has this regard to the human race as well. That's not enough for That doesn't make a love romantic. Is it maybe romantic activity that makes the difference? Right. So when that people who are in romantic relationships do stuff like they talk to each other, they share their feelings, they have meals together, they go to the movies together, they hold hands, they hug. Yeah, well, so do Kyle and Megan. So that's not it. Is it some kind of drive to these activities taken together? I mean, how are they going to do all of these together, do all of these separately, but do they actually do them as intensely and maybe all of them in the way of a romantic couple does? Maybe not. But is that really what makes a love romantic, going to the movies together? No, I don't think so. And here's why. Uh, erotic love. It's natural to human beings. It's been around as long as human beings have been around. Came and came women didn't. Not only didn't go to movies, but they didn't even yearn to go to the movies. It's not like their love was unfulfilled for not doing these things, right? And there's nothing, the point isn't, right? All these things are culturally determined uh, aspects of romantic love. They're not, but romantic love is something that is natural to human beings. But here's something cave men and cave women did do, fortunately for us. They had sex. <laughs> okay, we, 
We can be very confident of this. We don't need archaeological data. <laughs> it's kind of funny. I mean, there's things you know about them without having archaeological data. Like, we don't need skeletons, you know, sort of, they were buried by a volcano in the act, you know? <laughs> and we can suspect <coughs> simply because they were human beings like us and we know what human beings are like. But they appreciate one another, at least sometimes, as another being that one can unite sexually with. That's my problem. So I think actually the difference, one of the differences between romantic love and other kinds of love is that romantic love points towards sex. It points towards a union as one body. But of course, it doesn't always include it. But it points to it. There's a sexual tension. Right? That's what's missing in the Kyle and Megan story. There's nothing sexual about the Kyle and Megan relationship. Or at least I hope there isn't. So what is this sexual stuff? What is this union as one body? I think that if, if you, if this language of one body that we get in the Bible, I think it reflects what people actually want. People want to be united with another in this intimate way as one body. This is the sort of thing poets you know, talk about. Two hearts in one body, that sort of thing. But what is this? What is this? It's, I guess, some sort of metaphor. But let's see if we can say something about it. It has to be something that's very important, I think. Because Romantic love, occupy, while it may not be the most important form of human love, because I don't think, I don't know that there is a, the most important form of human love, it's still a very important form of human love. And so what is central to it is going to be important. So it has to be some kind of important human. Not just any old contact is going to lead to a human as one body, like wrestling or hugging. That's not enough for a human as one body. We all know this. Wrestlers don't, I mean, they look like one, one sort of churning body with multiple limbs, with eight limbs, but they're not one body. And even if you hug, they're not one body. Also, the way scripture describes it, it seems like the language is very physical. So this human as one body, I think that's to have a biological importance. It's a union as one flesh. Flesh is something very physical. And that means that this union as one body is not just defined by psychological closeness or feelings of pleasure. That wouldn't be physical enough. One could have that just by having electrodes implanted in one's brain. And of course, the biblical authors, what they had in mind when they talked about union as one body is presumably intercourse. So I want to look at intercourse and think about why, what is it about intercourse that would make it suitable for being a union as one body in a way in which wrestling together isn't? What is it about intercourse that makes it be an appropriate way or, or the thing that romantic love wants. Is it just a question of which body parts are involved? Um, here's sort of one way I'd be sort of a central challenge of sexual ethics. And you may not agree with my answer to this central challenge, but I think the challenge is one that's really worth thinking about, whether you agree with where I'm going, how I'm going to answer the challenge or not. And the challenge is, it's not my own son. I heard a talk years and years ago when I was a grad student. And the challenge was, how would you explain to an alien who has a completely different kind of biology what sex is and why humans care so much? Because humans do care a lot. I mean, even in a culture that's, a, that's allegedly casual, humans care a ton about sex. Right? Even in the most casual setting, people have tons of restrictions, personal restrictions, about whom they will have sex with. 
first of all, most people, right off the bat, exclude from the list of sexual partners half of humanity, just on the grounds of gender. Then they exclude a large swath of humanity on the grounds of age. Then, uh, then many, most perhaps, perhaps uh, exclude another large swath of humanity on the grounds of attractiveness. <coughs> Right? So there's something people are not, even if people take sex seemingly casually, they're really actually being rather more picky than you would expect if it was entirely casual. I actually suspect there's some less casuality going around than people think. I, I once um, at Georgetown University, there's a little survey of my uh, first year students, but it wasn't a survey. I assigned them to write papers about sexual attitudes of themselves and of other people, and of other students. And I thought it was a curious pattern that the majority of people thought the following everybody but me takes sex very casually. <laughs> and I think that. I think that I think that they, they probably take it more casually than they think, <coughs> to some degree. But other people take it less casually than they think. I think the mean is actually somewhere in between. And sex does really matter to people. I mean, that's why sex sells stuff, right? Because it matters to people. So, how would we explain to Emily why it does? Well, you might try to give them a definition of sex. Here's a definition of sex. <laughs> Smart, highly paid lawyers came out with this one, right? <laughs> they read it for yourself. A person engages in sexual relations, when the person you know that they engage in or causes contact with, and then comes a long list, with an intent to arouse or ratify the sexual desire of any person. I mean, wonder if that's what we tell people. And this is what happens. That's why you touch the other person. There's a specific list of body parts. I mean, one, two, three, four, five, six. There's six body parts. And if you touch them with an aim to sexually gratify another person, you're having sex. And people really care about this, touching of these six bits of the body. And the alien thinks, my humans are weird. <laughs> and doesn't. I mean, the alien might understand, yeah, okay, different species do different things differently, but there's a way in which the alien is missing something important. They're missing why it's so important to us. And it's not just a list of body parts. So how would we explain to that? Well, here's my suggestion. We explain to the alien that intercourse involves reproductive organs. <laughs> That's how human beings mate. Right? Presumably, all life forms reproduce. They don't all reproduce sexually. Some reproduce asexually. If we live in an infinite multiverse, there surely are aliens who reproduce in other ways than sexually and asexually. Maybe they need to have nine beings come together to exchange genetic material. Who knows? But if it's a living thing, it carries on itself past its death through children. There's something like reproduction. So the concept of reproduction should not be alien to the alien, though the mode of it should be. So we tell the alien, my suggestion, this is how humans are made. And I think that if the alien is a moral being, has as I think a real intelligent alien would be. It would be a being, if there are such beings, they are creatures in the image and likeness of God. And creatures, they would be creatures that would have ethics. And I think they would say, part one of these things that they would think, if their ethics was not totally corrupt, they would see that the human that life of any kind of species where you have persons, is sacred in some way. They might not be religious, but the concept of the sacred is a concept you can have even if you're not religious. 
So I think there's at least some hope. Well, maybe not. Maybe, maybe there's just no way of communicating with, with, with aliens at all, and, and there's no way we can teach them constantly. But I think there's some hope. But once you find out that it's reproduction, they will see why it's important to human beings. In the same way that, hope, that hopefully some other arrangement is important to them, whatever they do. Once we say that this is how these are reproductive organs, this is human making, this is how humans make more humans. Theologically, this is how humans participate in the creation of new beings in the image and likeness of God. It becomes clearer how intercourse unites people as one body. For the parts of the body work together, work together. They cooperate. It's not like cats glued, super glued together that are fighting each other. Parts of my body work together for a common goal. Right? The heart pumps the blood through the body, um, which provides oxygen to my muscles. The muscles enable me to lift food in my mouth, which then enables more things. And we have this cycle of all of these things working together. In this case, it's the same my body. And for many functions, we can fulfill on our own. But there's one human function that we cannot fulfill on our own, and that's reproduction. So it seems like it's, you know, I don't, there isn't any, like I said, inter philosophically inter interesting terms don't really have a definition. But it seems like one of the marks of life is reproduction. But we are incomplete in that, each of us. None of us can reproduce on our own, except in intercourse. So intercourse joins two organisms in an organic whole. Their bodies cooperate for reproduction. That's what happens there. And it happens even if reproduction doesn't happen. And it happens even if reproduction cannot happen. And this is what joins the people, is that their bodies are uniting in this way that's aimed at reproduction. Even if you are not thinking about reproduction, even if they actually don't want reproduction, that's still what's going on. And the pleasure of sex is a sign of this union. And of course, this union is not possible for some people. Some people have physical problems. They just don't have the right organs, or their organs are not functioning. Some people are of the same sex, and they cannot unite in an organic whole in this way. There are lots of Some cannot unite in this way for psychological reasons. There are all sorts of reasons why people might not be able to do this. And finally, I want to bring one more dimension. So this was sort of biological. But we're not just animals. I think we are animals. That's something we learned from, uh, from evolutionary theory. We really are animals. But we're not just mere animals. Right? The Christian tradition talks of the soul. And I take that fairly literally. But even if you don't, there's something beyond mere animality there. Our bodies express our souls. Now, in intercourse, here's what happens. Two people unite. And they unite in the most thorough way possible for human beings, in the most thorough way that's both that is bodily, voluntary, and equal. So you can have unequal unions that are very intimate, like the union between a, a pregnant mother and her child, but it's not an equal union. And it's sometimes not a voluntary union. Um, but intercourse is the most thorough, at least it's the most thorough bodily, voluntary, and equal union of bodies. And if people engage in intercourse without, sorry, without there being a matching union of them as persons, a union of their souls of some sort, there's a mismatch between what their bodies are doing and what they are doing as persons. There's a way in which their bodies are expressing something that isn't there. They're expressing a union that isn't there. And the people are kind of disconnected from the bodies. Because their bodies are united, but as people they are not united. So they are in some way not treating their bodies as fully apart of who they are. 
Now, I think one of the really special things about human beings, I think it's from Nietzsche, actually, is that human beings have this incredible power to extend their will over their future actions. Nietzsche said this is when the human animal became, Nietzsche says the human animal became interesting when it became capable of making promises. <laughs> Through promises, we can bind ourselves in the future. We can control our own future actions. This is an incredible power of God. We, you know, if you make a promise, if you're a sincere and moral person, a sincere and moral person, you might change your mind about the thing, but you will still keep it for the sake of the promise. This amazing way in which our will is extended into our future. <coughs> And we are beings that live through time. And so I think the most thorough union of body is, should be matched with the most thorough union of persons. And the most thorough union of persons is going to include a union that extends itself through time, extends itself through a commitment to be with each other until death. And we call this commitment of marriage. Biological union by itself is monetary. Commitment takes this biological union, which is an animal act in some way, it's a, it's a mating, other primates, other mammals, other non mammals, do it with some variation. Um, and, but commitment makes it personal, it adds time and will to it. So commitment turns this into a truly personal act. So in committed sexual union, there's a kind of joining of the personal and the biological. So in closing, love includes three aspects: appreciation, goodwill, and union. Different kinds of love require different kinds of union. Eros, erotic love, romantic love. Pulls lovers to a union as one body. This union as one body completes too as a reproductive whole, even if they don't actually reproduce. You can be united with somebody in pursuance of a goal, even if you don't have to achieve that goal, even if you don't expect to achieve that goal. You might be united with your buddies in the army in an attack that you know is hopeless, but it's still a union and a goal. Or you can, and this can be actually quite a profound Sometimes, though, in particularly blessed cases, it is actually succeeds in refusing. Marriage takes this biological thing and extends it through a commitment over time. And find a little theological note, right? This love, this romantic love mirrors the love in the Trinity. Mirrors the way that the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father and the Son. The union of the Father and the Son is a, is a union directed to the Holy Spirit, or to a union that results in the Holy Spirit. And marriage is the best when the couple has the blessing of children, though it's still there even when the couple doesn't have the blessing of children. It's not the only way, though, of mirroring the love of the Trinity. Um, this, uh, for Christians, the most, the most thorough human way of mirroring the love of the Trinity is the life of Jesus. And it's in it. Jesus did not marry. So there's a way of mirroring the love of the Trinity without this romantic thing. But the romantic way is a good way of doing it. Nonetheless, Jesus and Paul both insists that some people are, need to be celibate for the sake of the kingdom. Some have a higher call. So it's, it's a very important way of mirroring God's love, but it's not the only way. Thank you. Now it's time for us to hear your questions and for Professor Priest to respond. So, does anyone have first questions? I have my own questions. 
so. <laughs> um, so I was wondering, Professor Cruz, um, you're talking about how marital um, sex in the context of marriage is sort of an ideal. Um, in what way is it problematic to um, pursue sex outside of marriage? And why would that be more wrong? It might not be ideal, but why would that entail as well? Yeah. The picture there, I think, is, let me just reiterate part I said and maybe extend a little bit. It's this idea that our bodies should express who we are. Our bodies are kind of expression of who we are. And when the bodies are uniting, it makes, it, there's a kind of way in which one is lying with one's body when the mind isn't behind it in the same way. It's like an insincere smile. But perhaps, but an insincere smile is not a big deal. Right? It's, it may, maybe smooths over social relations at times. Maybe sometimes something like an insincere smile maybe is even a good thing. Um, maybe you think insincere smiles can lead to sincere smiles later on. I don't like you, maybe I think. But if I smile at you, maybe I'll get to like you. I mean, we do feel like we don't agree with it. So, but I think sex isn't like that, uh, exactly. I think it's a, it's a more intimate expression of ourselves. It's not just like a smile. Um, it's a way of actually being one body with another person. And for that reason, I think it, because it's this more serious, more thorough expression, and also a less, I think, a culturally relative expression. Smiling, for instance, is in different cultures. In all cultures, there's some kind of uh, a sense that smiling conveys one's own being pleased in some way. But the exact nuances of it are extremely different. Sex there are going to be nuances that are different, but I think it's going to be overall there's going to be something that the differences will be smaller. And I think sex with someone that one doesn't have a commitment to is a kind of lie. And by the way, this is a, this is a to give credit where credit is due, I got this philosophy, this uh, argument from Vincent Prunzo, who's, as far as I can tell, an atheist philosopher. He's a very curious uh, book on ethics <laughs> where, where he gives this argument against what he calls against primarial sex. And I think it's a very interesting argument. It's this idea of you're treating your body as if it wasn't really you. If you, if the bodies unite without the minds uniting, and so you sort of disintegrate yourself. In the corner of that, how do you account for uh, the kinds of, of sex, like war or war? Yeah. So, so what I'm trying to set out is, is a kind of framework. And so then maybe we have specific questions of what follows from this framework. Um, oral sex by itself does not produce a union as one body. It's more like the thing that we had in the Clinton definition. It's one of the things in the Clinton in the permutations envisioned by the Clinton definition. It doesn't produce a union as one body. It may produce some psychological closeness. Um, I think it's morally problematic because it has the same, it has many of the same emotions that intercourse has. There's this, orgasm is a feel, it involves a feeling of closeness and intimacy. It in fact is, I think, a feeling of being united with another person as one body. And to have, to induce that feeling when there isn't a union as one body, I think it's problematic. We shouldn't deceive ourselves in things that are really important. Um, now, there's practical questions, right? You might ask, could a couple engage in these things in their, say, fully marital lovemaking? Could they also do these other things? Could they engage in all sorts of stimulation in the context of intercourse? And there are going to be, be practical questions like that. I think in the context of where intercourse occurs, all sorts of 
things can be connected with age, of course, and can be part of what the couple does. But it is because they are connected with the intercourse in some ways, leading up to it or coming after it, that it, the, the feelings become non-deceptive. Yes, um, so I was wondering if you could address different views that people might have towards that uniting of the minds in marriage. So say someone thinks that the institution of marriage is obsolete or unimportant or too battered by rates of divorce to really be a meaningful expression of that uniting of the minds now. So for example, Oprah, I know, has been with the same person for a long time and just you know, uh, rejects the institution of marriage. So would you say that, that they just misunderstand the ideal of it, or how would you address that type of uh, belief? Yeah. So, I mean, to, uh, like any else from society, to some, I, mean, it, I, I think there's a lot of wisdom in natural law type of ethics. And natural law type of ethics was not going to identify marriage with a social institution. It identifies marriage with an exchange of commitment between two people. I always cringe when I hear somebody say, the clergyman married the two people. That is, that is, that is I think, a mistake. Two people marry each other. They exchange commitment with one another. And the clergyman witnesses that commitment if they are Christian, hopefully a clergyman witnesses it. If a clergyman is available, they're on a desert island, and a clergyman is available, perhaps one of them is a clergyman. Uh, <laughs> so then, uh, then they do it without one. Yeah. But I think it's the commitment that is the crucial thing, but it's a serious commitment, right? And in our society, I think if one isn't, doesn't really go through the legal forms, I think that, that is a sign that one doesn't have that commitment. Uh, that's not an absolute, right? If we live in a country like Nazi Germany, where certain mar where uh, certain marriages that are quite morally unproblematic are forbidden, you might well have people who marry without any kind of legal uh, background for it. Um, for instance, the Catholic Church has uh, it has this in its canon law has its provisions for secret marriages, which are not at all, which the state knows nothing about. They are written about in the wishes secret archives. And they're precisely meant for cases like the Nazi Germany case. So the crucial thing is the exchange of commitment. Now, there's a, a further question is it a good thing that this exchange of commitment be recognized by the state? And I think that's actually a separate question. I think it is. And the reason for that is that there's a third kind of dimension. I talked about the biological dimension, the commitment dimension. I think there's a third dimension of human beings, and that's a social dimension. When a most thorough union of people, one would like to have that union recognized by others. There's something one wants to be treated by others as united with this person. To be seen by society as united in this way. And that's why I think it is actually appropriate for there to be social recognition of this status. But it's not necessary. Sometimes one, one can't have this. So for instance, here, here's the consequence of this view. Now, I hold a traditional conservative position on same-sex marriage. But if I didn't hold that position, if I thought it was possible for people of the same sex to marry, I would think they could do this without, no matter what the states have said. They could do this in all states, because marriage is constituted by, by this undying exchange of commitment, this, commit, this absolute commitment, and they could do that. question at times, and 
And the story I came up with is, I don't want to say it just during intercourse, but it's, I, and, and I think it's this will to live a joint life that extends it, this, this commitment to each other that extends it. But it's only, I think, a, bio, a fully biological union at those times. But, it become, but it's a personal union at other times. Well, let's see. There's something like a biological component, too, though, because like, think of our body parts, right? So our body parts, this, like, it's, a met, it's sort of a metaphor for how our body parts work together. Not all of our body parts are all the time you know, doing stuff. Some of the time, our body parts are sitting in readiness. Right? I mean, sitting there, my arm is not moving, but at any time, I'm ready to move my arm. And that's already this kind of readiness to move unites this arm to me. Uh, in the book, I use this phrase that uh, a ready army is not an idle arm. There's always some kind of activity going on. And so I think that even when the couple's not actually in bed, there's some kind of readiness for a union, commitment to it, an exclusivity that makes them be in some way one body, but in a less thorough way. I mean, it is a metaphor, I think, in some way. I mean, I'm, not, I don't, I'm not reading that one body is utterly literal, like that there were two bodies, and, and then either there's a third one, or the two cease to be, and there's just one. Now, you could do that. I, I, I think I, I want to try to defend, but I'm not pushing it, that literal reading. And so I think you can still have something like that metaphor of one body, but to a lesser extent. Practice. It's extremely difficult to love another person as oneself. 
And maybe in heaven, this kind of, this love, in this life, for many of us, loving a spouse and maybe loving our children is the closest we come to loving somebody truly as ourselves. In heaven, you don't have the, you don't have this difficulty. This is part of the transformation that happens. And maybe that's that could be one reason why we don't need this kind of relationship there. I mean, there's also the issue maybe reproduction isn't needed in heaven. And also there's the fact that it's since the bodily union, it makes some it makes I think a lot of sense to think if it's a bodily union, it ends with the destruction of the body. Now granted, Christians believe that, so that's what happens to death, the body is destroyed. And it's a bodily union. Now granted, Christians also believe that one day, that one day is the right way to talk, and that's what the temporal relations are, but just talk about it. But one day, the bodies will be resurrected. And I guess one could imagine maybe God could just as he resurrects the bodies, he could resurrect the marriages. But I think what Jesus is saying is suggest that he won't. And there's some reason not to know. That's really all I can say. I, mean, I, th I, I think you know, God could have gone about it both ways. He could have resurrected one of the marriages, but then you have to solve problems to which one. Would he have polygyny or polyandry? Would he choose the best one and make that one continue? Or would he do something else? I mean, another possibility could have been. So I could have decided that remarriage is not permissible even after a spouse is dead. That would be really tough on people. Uh, the Eastern Orthodox, while they don't say that, they do think that, uh, uh, that, that, the, God, that the, the New Testament teachings strongly discourage remarriage even after spouses die. Um, so maybe God could have set up a system like that, but I think I, I like the system we've got. Uh, but th this is, you know, th this really does ask interesting theological questions. Um, I like the, it's I think a very interesting question to ask, what happens in heaven to these earthly relationships? And I think that there's, there is a deep relationship that remains, but I don't think it's a marital relationship. Yeah, there's the body, 
and it's nothing but atoms whizzing about according to the laws of physics with no, uh, with no further meaning besides that conveyed by the beauty of the, the equations of quantum physics. Um, that does make uh, sexual ethics problematic, but I think it also makes just all ethics problematic. I mean, how, why do I care about what happens to these squeezing mounds of matter? I think that, and I think the better kind of materialists don't say that. They're not going to say, well, yeah, they'll say, they do think that, that our bodies are made out of nothing by these particles, but they will also say, yeah, but these particles, as arranged as they are, they acquire a special meaning. They become conscious together, at least. And that seems hard to deny that I'm conscious. So most materials don't deny that they're conscious. A few do. There's some weird, weird ones like that. And there's some materials who think that they don't believe anything. They think they don't think anything. Um, but most materials have the sensible view that, of course, we think things. Of course, the things we do at least most philosophical measures, and of course, we, the things we do matter, our bodies matter to some degree. I think that you can build something like this story. There may be some, some things may be less plausible on that story, but I think, I think a material should be able to see human life as sacred. If not, that's a really good reason not to be a materialist. And I think there are good reasons not to be a materialist, but I think materials can get that. Okay. Uh, hello. Is there um, something problematic with willfully uh, changing your gender identity or sex? That's a hard question, and uh, of course, and. Uh, I worry about a couple of things here. One of them is that we shouldn't, I think, buy into an attitude that our bodies are our property. This is sort of based on Christian revelation, that our bodies are to do with as we see fit. We don't own our bodies. And it's part of that is because God owns them, and part of that is because they are part of us, and we don't own ourselves. Ownership is just the right concept of life. Um, there are going to be borderline questions that are really difficult. That are really difficult. Like people with uh, XXY chromosomes. Are they male? Are they female? What should be done with their sexual organs? Should, what kind of surgery should be done? I don't really have answers to these kinds of questions as to what should be done. I, I think if, in fact, there is some important sense in which a person is male, they shouldn't be made into a female. Um, and I think it would be, one, if you made somebody, a male look like a female and a female look like a male, I don't actually think it will change. Now, that's because I don't think male and female is determined by how one looks. It's determined by what, uh, what one's reproductive system if what it is for, and what kind, whether it's for its reproductive system that's for uniting with and reproducing with the male, and if that's what it is, then one's female, or it's a reproductive system for reproducing with it. Uh, Male, which is when it's female. Um, so I, I, I think in practice, uh, so, so I think the, the fact that one doesn't feel male, isn't there a reason to make oneself look female? But there are going to be hard questions, and, and particularly hard ones for me are questions where biologically, the gender identity is determined. And here's where I sort of think about our, the line from Aristotle that we really, it, that ethics, I'm paraphrasing very much, that ethics, unlike mathematics, is very messy. 
And there are going to be cases where we can only speak approximately, and for the most part. And we can't say exactly what it is to be done in every single case. Um, let's just have a couple That's more. That's not easy with you, but you know, that, 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 that is the reality of life. Uh, just a couple more questions. Um, you, over there? Um, <coughs> Are you disregarding that asexual people can have a true romantic relationship? 
there's no, you mean when there isn't any kind of drive towards uh, sexuality? Yeah, I think it's not really romantic then. I think it's more of this. But I, but I think, I, I actually think this is something that our culture gets deeply wrong, is our culture thinks that if it's not romantic, it's more shallow. And I, I think it's one of the things that I think are really important for Christians to do especially around these sexuality questions, is to recover this idea that there can be very deep relationships between people that are not sexual in nature. Right? In our culture, there's this fear people have that if they have this, especially in, say, two men, uh, they have, may have this fear that they will be seen as, in some way, having a sexual relationship if they have deep emotional intimacy. It's more culturally acceptable between women. But I think it's really important to recognize that there are types of relationships, there are new ways, there we can have all sorts of creativity about ways of arranging relationships. And there are ways for people to have deep friendships that are not sexual in nature. And these things, like my story of the twins, will have many of the features of romantic love. But there's still, I think, something deeply different. But not worse. Perhaps I'm not saying it's better either. It, it, I'm not saying I know we kind of like saying sex is a bad thing, but it's different. Thank you, everyone, for coming, and thank you, Dr. Professor Bruce, for your presentation, for answering your questions. Um, just remind you to turn in your surveys in the back up there and um, just give them a round of applause.